Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very last Facebook evaluations video for the orchestration challenge number one. Ravel's uh, beautiful little waltz piece here uh, in D-flat, and I really, really enjoyed uh, evaluating everybody's scores from Facebook, and Patreon is to follow now. Um, but first, we've got four scores to get out of the way, and um, yeah, I just really enjoyed looking at all of them. Let's start with Gerard's entry, which is a partial entry. It's just basically the first, uh, you know, the first subject, first episode of the first subject. And, you know, it's it's kind of fun. Um, I think the, the main thing that I can do here is just give a little bit of feedback on, on the structure. And since it's so short, I can actually give quite quite a bit more feedback per page. So starting off with... There is um, a section here where the horns sort of take over um, um, from the A clarinets. And interestingly, it's transposed into D major, which is a lot of fun. And, you know, it makes the, makes the orchestra a little bit more naturally resonant. Now, it's kind of interesting that I did not do this myself after actually there was another piece that was in D flat that that was in a previous orchestration challenge from years ago before I started doing them on you know doing the evaluations on screen like this and uh, it was for a piece by WC and and it was in D flat and I transposed it to D because I wanted a lot of natural um, you know just natural string resonance in it and harmonics uh, sort of natural harmonics from open strings and so uh, so yeah so but in in this case I actually kept it in D flat for you know for different reasons which I'll explain when I'll get to it but it's interesting that very few people opted to go to D major and it's actually kind of fun it's 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 neat to hear it in D and it actually allows the um, the violins to go a little teeny bit lower right um, they they can go all the way down to what would have been G flat now playing it as a G so should the should the arranger choose to do that and it also gives you know some open strings here and there like for instance this can be an open D in the um, in your uh, double bass you know and and this can also be an open open D for the cello so anyway um, yeah just a really really cool fun uh, beginning of an effort here and uh, the only thing that I, I would sort of question here on the first page is that right now you've got this wonderful beautiful blend of clarinets with violas and this will really just you know this will kind of perfectly merge and you know the the two sounds will be very very um, complementary of each other now here, though, you change to horns, and now while horns can blend very well with violas, they have to be much, much softer, right? If you want to achieve the same unity that you did here with clarinets, then you really just do have to drop the horns to, like, pianissimo, and then even at that, you will have a markedly different quality of blending here. So if you really wanted a different, you know, just to sort of change things around, then that's fine. But if you didn't want anything to be perceptible, then you might as well just keep the clarinets going, right? You know, there's kind of nothing on this first page that would that would sort of require them uh, to do anything else. Now, it's it's interesting that there's actually a very, very, kind of a very sparse, um, very sparse, orchestration here kind of like two of each um, except one bassoon uh, you know with uh, with the auxiliary being the second player so yeah enjoyed that in interesting clarinets in a instead of in B flat just to um, go with the sharp key signature that's all good now here I feel this is too strong of an entrance and I, and, and once again you know, everybody is being being soft, and it is quite acceptable for the violins to be soft in this. They know that they're playing the melody. Right now, this is a bit of an imbalance of the violins really being strong. It's almost like a lead guitar solo in here, right? It would be better for everybody to be soft, 
right? And the violins will just naturally be louder because they there are the most violins of any string instrument, and they are right in front of the audience. So you don't need to mark them up to mezzo forte. And then this entrance can also be P, right? Because, you know, at this point, you just have a big melody with a tiny bit of light accompaniment behind it, right? So it's better just for everybody to be soft. Okay, uh, unless the whole orchestra became mezzo forte. This is kind of fun. Um, just a little bit of, of harp stuck in there. Um, and triangle, horns. Interesting, the triangle's off the line there. Was it possibly that you moved it up so that you could access a different pitch from your playback? Just kind of curious about that. Now, this is really going to be bright. Okay, look at what you've got here. Everybody is soft, right? Then you're asking the violas and the and the uh, flute and oboe to be mezzo forte, and then and the the violins to continue playing mezzo forte. And now here you're asking the horns to be mezzo forte. Well, they are going to be the loudest thing right here. Okay, they always play louder than everybody else, especially in a very delicate chamber orchestra kind of arrangement like this, right? So let's rethink this entire thing. Okay. Let's keep the let's keep the horns and have everybody be P, including the violins, including this entrance here. Okay, and then um and then the horns here could play like there could be a crescendo, P crescendo, right? So everybody could crescendo up a little bit, but don't even bother saying what that is. Then have the horns come in here and have them play P, like crescendo from here to P from pianissimo to P, and then back down again. And then you have got your balance. And just leave these instruments at mezzo piano. That's That would be a balanced orchestration there, um, in which all of the voices had a certain equal footing, right? Um, and this is kind of fun. You know, you've got your triple octave, and you've got your octave here uh, above... You know, the violas doubling the violins is going to be a very thick, meaty tone there um, as a result. It's, this is kind of strange, just having this A-sharp sort of stick out of the... Yeah, and th once again, this will be the loudest thing in the texture, and also with the English horn, right? So, so yeah, so it needs a little bit of work in terms of balancing things, but there's, like, nothing here that is totally, you know... It's just really more a matter of taste. If you want to stack winds on top of the strings... Keep in mind that the oboe and the English horn are both going to basically just blend into this extremely thick texture, and it's going to make that texture of this melody very, very warm and almost sort of buzzing a kind of warmth. And then the flute, an octave above it, is going to get slightly buried in the overtones from this very thick melody. And then the piccolo, though, you'll be able to hear the piccolo very clearly above it. Okay, and um, yeah, and then you have your clarinets come in and kind of finish up for the for the horns. I mean, I understand the idea that you're doing here with the go clarinets going to horns and then back to clarinets to get a softer thing, but the horns are a lot stronger than you think in terms of the uh, the way that you've scored this. But anyways, I, I wish that there was more. See, that's it. That's the end. I have I have nothing more to say on this score. I wish I I wish I had another couple of pages to comment on. But yeah, um, yeah. So, anyways, Gerard, it's just really fun to take a look at this, and um, and just really enjoyed it, and uh, looking forward to maybe a little bit more in the next challenge, which will be in a few months. People are asking me, well, when is the next challenge? What is the next challenge? I've got a piece picked out. And it's going to be pretty dynamic, pretty different from what everybody is used to. And it's going to be by a composer that everybody knows. Um, and a lot of people admire. Some people like him. Some people don't. Um, but this piece is going to be really cinematic and and just really, you know, just a lot of fun. So, um, but that's probably not going to be until maybe like th February or, or something like that. We have to get through the holidays. I can't just throw a a big orchestration challenge in the middle of, you know, in the middle of the holidays. No, you know, it sort of cuts out more than half of the composers who would be able to participate. So anyway, um, thanks very much, Gerard. Now on to the next score. So our second score for this last batch of Facebook evaluations 
is by Rubens, and it's also incomplete, and that's cool. I think incomplete um, entries are, are great. I think they're fine. Once again, I can focus more on less pages. So um, this is kind of a fun score. There's just, just to point out this one layout error is that you should have pulled this uh, brace down here to the bottom and also pulled down this, um, this bar line so that all of the instruments of the section would have the same bar line, just the same as it is up here for your winds. Okay, so that probably was something maybe you added your double bases last or, or maybe you accidentally sort of hooked your mouse into the bar line and dragged it up or something. I don't know. But anyways, it should all be, you know, one big, uh, one big section unless this were like, say, electric bass or something like that, if this were a crossover score. So, um, I am not going to argue about taste so much just to kind of talk about like whether or not something works in terms of scoring and um it's kind of fun uh, the way that you have scored the accompaniment at the beginning really just covers every single beat and it removes a little bit of the syncopation of the first you know 8 to 16 bars right there is um when you sort of underline every single beat um instead of going bum 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 bum, because there's like, because like, what is the syncopation? It's bum bum dun dun bum dun dun, right? It's it's it is meant to sort of play with your sense of whether or not it is a waltz over um, over three beats of quarter notes or three beats of of half notes, right? So when you play every single quarter note in uh, across two bars then it sort of takes away from that feeling of syncopation. Um, kind of interesting, adding the bassoon there, doubling the pizzicato just here and there, rather than everything until you get to here. You could just mark staccato here, and then it would all be staccato, right? Instead of having to, um, you know, and then people, you know, the, the player would naturally not staccato on the half note, right? So you can o only have to just mention it here, and then the player will just naturally. Now, you say that this is a solo, what makes you say this is a solo? If you mean for just one bassoon, you should just write the number one, right? Solo does not mean one single player. Solo means that this is a featured voice that the conductor is going to attempt to bring forwards. So you did not write a solo here. You just wrote a part that doubles the cellos, right? And the same thing here. You didn't write a solo here. You wrote a part that doubles the second violins, right? So don't write solo indiscriminately. Now, just talking about your um, about your dynamics here, um, this is just really weird that you got forte on the violas, mezzo forte on the violins, p on the seconds, and everybody else, and then p here and mezzo forte there, and so on. There just really isn't a sense of unified dynamics. You should try to score things so that the so that the instruments can all be pretty much the same dynamic and they can balance just naturally depending on what their function is and what their position is, what their register is, right? So I'm, I'm not really seeing that here. I'm seeing a lot of tweaking as to like, oh, this one is that loud and that one is this loud and so on and so forth. Now, I'll give you props for having, um, for having more nuances in your... In your um, across not 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 just in your melody but just across the entire orchestra and that's good okay although that sort of falls apart here like with no nuances here once you get loud right what what happened after that it's not going to stop needing nuances um now uh, and, and the other thing too is just there was like no slurring to show us like how the violin is the first violins are going to be bowing this melody uh, rather than rather th there you just had like single you know everything was a single note right a single bow so that needs a little bit of work so yeah so just dynamics need a lot of work and and phrasing and also just you know just some touch-up stuff here and there tambourine that's a very interesting effect okay um and then you know here you do, you know, more of the same of playing every single beat with the accompaniment. Um, but, you know, th here at B, this actually sort of is, is kind of where the... Uh, kind of where the the accompaniment goes to, right? 
but the whole point is to stop on the second beat. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Right, because really the syncopation is dun, dun. Like it's one, two, three. One, two, three. Right? So, so these little guys down here are just leading into the downbeat every other bar, right? And then the second beat of that every other bar is meant to kind of hold, as if that were holding for the rest of, or, or making a statement, a rhythmic statement that would last until the next bum bum, right? It's a tricky distinction. So here you got it right, but uh, yeah, um, you don't need to fill in every single beat, right? Because like when you do that, you might take away the feeling, uh, the rhythmic feeling. Okay, and this is strange. You know, wh why is the why are the violas loud and everybody else soft? I don't understand. Right, just so, some of these, some of these dynamic, um, some of these dynamics just seem to be whatever they are. Right, so, but you really have to, you know, part of the whole science or craft of painting an orchestral picture is that you really have to be much more in control of the dynamics and think of the. You know, think of your landscape a little bit better, right? So here you have really loud flutes, right? And everybody else is soft, except for the violas, which are really loud. And then the, clarin the clarinets are sort of doing this mezzo forte down to piano thing over and over again, okay? So so the, really, you know, what's going to be heard here is the flute and the clarinet. And the, and the violas are going to just be really, really loud doubling on the on the clarinets and look your your dynamics don't match right so you have your clarinets playing really loud and the violas are playing pretty much the same thing as the clarinets and they are have a completely different dynamic scheme all right so you got to fix that they should really should have the same thing yeah. now here you jump in with your violas and start playing the same notes as the uh, as the flutes and that's fine except for the fact that you don't you never put an ottava over an alto clef. You always just go to treble clef, right? So whatever this would be in treble clef is what you should have here with the um with your uh yeah, just put a treble clef here. So 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 just score it out exactly like this, right? That's what it would be. Now here, um this makes sense solo. It would be actually the other way around it would be two solo, right? Or one solo, two solo. Now, if you're going to mark ah two on something, you don't need to put both vo both voices. If there are both voices stated in a line, that is the same thing as writing ah two. So it's either one or the other. Either this is a single line on single stems in a single voice, and it says ah two over it, or it is th just as you've written here, but no ah two. Right. So just pick one or the other, because this is confusing. Right. It's overdoing it. And then one solo. If you're going to go back to that, that's fine. Now, once you've said that it's a solo over here, you don't need to say it over and over again, right? You just solo, solo, and then it's just is it taken to be a solo until the nature of the music changes. All right. Okay, so with all respect, I feel that there's just too much flute carrying everything, right? So you have a flute. You have the flute being the dominant voice here. Um... And if this were scored in a balanced way, like with everybody being, like let's say everybody being pianissimo and the flute being P, then I think that that would be perfect. Because that is the dynamic at that point. Okay, so here I just think like more flute, right? So we kind of don't get a break from the sense of what, of flute, right? And you don't need to trade off between the two like that. You just have one person. You know, the first flute is just going to want to play all the melody, and the second flute is going to want to support. That is their jobs. Okay? Um, cornet comes in and plays, and why doesn't the cornet have the little word solo over it, right? Just say it should say solo. This is kind of fun, though. I, by the way, I really like the idea of putting a cornet in there. I think that's a cornet. I hope that's not core. Yeah, it's cornet. Okay. Um, yeah, so it just just a little confusing the way the the things have been put. So and then mezzo forte decrescendo to mezzo forte. That's just a little strange. It's better to just not even have the cornet play this and have everybody else play it and then the cornet start again here. 
um, doubling the violins. By the way, this is a huge amount of weight, right? And and uh, I've said this a few times before, mezzo forte, diminuendo to mezzo piano is like going from blah to bleh, right? It's go like going from, from kind of grayscale to kind of beige scale, you know? It just really... And, and also, look at this. You're just going pizzicato, soft, 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 soft. And all of a sudden, you're loud. And then you're going down to kind of like, you know, kind of blah, right? So why aren't these little hairpins on your pizzicato, right? And what's what's going on here? P, P and then all of a sudden, you're mezzo forte on just one instrument in the middle. So you got to think out these things a little bit more. Like, really make the whole page make sense, all right? Okay, and, and by the way, this is a lot of pizzicato. This is going to be extremely strong. You probably could get away with just like um, just the violas and the cellos and just leave out the violins. You know what I mean? And you'd have enough strength to support this. All right. Okay, and just kind of... Now, here you are assuming something. You are assuming that your flute is... Hang on, am I skipping a page here? No. Okay. Here you are assuming that your flutes are really, really powerful and loud. And that this is going to mean anything whatsoever to the first violin. It's not. Okay, it's not. It's The flutes are at their weakest. And you can put as many accents and as much crescendo as you like down there. But unless they are supported with almost nothing in the rest of the orchestra, they are superfluous. They are not even needed. See, what you've got here is really more of a line for, for cornet, say, what, what you've got, or clarinets, right? It's more that than it is, and maybe even the violinists don't even need any help. Okay, and, you know, wouldn't there be a slur maybe over this? Okay, so at this point, it, it sort of starts to come apart a little bit, and once again, just relying on flute again to do a lot of the a lot of the uh, melody work. So, so all right, so overall I would say please consider using other instruments for your melody uh, from time to time, not just flute all the time, like oboe, right? Um, like you don't have any oboes, and boy, you could have used oboes in a lot of places here. You could have used the clarinets for more than just kind of lower stuff like this, um, and the bassoons themselves can also play lots of melodic work, right? Um, it was kind of fun the way that you added xylophone. The mock-up is worth a listen. It's really fun. I mean, it's obviously, obviously you were, you were scoring more of a work, um, you know, more of an audio work than, than say a, a work for, um, you know, for a, on, on a piece of paper to be scored out. And the, the audio mock-up sounds really fun, actually, really cool. I, I like its attitude and I like its sort of, um, sort of irreverence. I think it's a lot of fun, but yeah, but the but the actual scoring craft needs a little bit of work there. But look, but really good start. I mean, tons of you know tons of great ideas, and you know obviously you're working with a lot of different um, you know lo lots of different. It's it's sort of like the whole orchestra is just like this big bag of goodies for you right now, and you're just sort of grabbing this piece and sticking it there to see how it works, and that is just a beautiful place to be. So I really enjoyed this, Rubens, and please, um, please do consider joining in on the next on the next orchestration challenge when I get around to it, because I think that that your particular style here, uh, you know, very exploratory kind of way would would actually suit really well the piece that I am planning. Okay, so on to the third score now. Okay, so our third score is by Astor and. You know, um, I did say something, maybe you missed it, um, but there was a reminder a couple weeks ago about, you know, please do not have separate staves for everything. You know, like here we've got two bassoons on separate staves, we've got two clarinets on separate staves, and two trumpets on separate staves, and you can see that the that, that forces, you know, with everything else that's on here, it really forces the, um, you know, we've got Divisi violins and everything else. It forces uh, like an almost unreadable 
a score on most uh, laptop screens, right? So, I mean, I'm not trying to tell everybody to dumb down their score or to use smaller orchestras or anything like that in their orchestration challenge, but it sort of, you know, puts me at a disadvantage of trying to really show everything that's on, on the page of your score, right? So I think that probably next... Um, next um, challenge, there is going to be a, a kind of a limit on the size of the orchestra, just, just so that it's readable. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there was a lot of really cool stuff going on in the percussion in this score and the and and everything else. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, it, it makes it kind of hard on me. And look, no apologies. Don't worry about that. I'm not upset about it or anything. But it's just, you know, just something that I'm kind of struggling under. <laughs> you know, to try to make it work for everybody. And it's just hard when I get a big, big, big score like this. And also just, you know, there are the, the staff size for this page could have been much larger, you know, could have, you know, you could have gone up quite a few percentage points and it would also have helped the readability. Okay. So with that said, I will say that I really enjoyed this piece a lot, this uh, arrangement a lot. And I thought that there was a lot of fun stuff to it. Towards the end, um, you leave out some harmony and some and some and some uh, some contrapuntal motion and and stuff, and it's sort of like I, I wonder if that was just you were rushed or something, or if you were intending to be spare or something like that. Anyway, so you probably noticed with this with this approach that you've got, you know, sort of start off a little bit just all winds. And then the strings come in with this uh, tremolo stuff, which really makes it sound measured tremolo, which makes it sound very, um, you know, 1950s, 1960s Hollywood. Um, you know, and then you come in with the, the violins sort of following the melody with the clarinets. And you probably noticed that on your playback, you could like the the flutes became inaudible. And that is actually what is going to happen in real life is that the flute above unless it's marked solo and it's marked up dynamically the overtones of the strings will basically just bury it and that is actually something that was used intentionally as a technique in the classical era which i think i've just i've talked about before um just that the overtones the lush overtones of you know especially mixing it in with clarinet um just can really you know it can kill flutes in their middle register but that's fine. If you intended that, then it worked brilliantly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, my same argument about nuance really does apply here. And I think also my cautions to people about trying to introduce some kind of uh, breathing and slurring approach and bowing and slurring approach to strings really does count here. You know what I mean? I mean, because right now, the way you've marked it is everybody is breathing. There's going to be an articul a breathing articulation and a bowing articulation on every single note of the melody. Now, if you intend that, then that's great. But I just feel that it's you're, you're losing some smoothness to the melody. Um, and But I will say, using the vibraphone, it's lovely. Uh, I, the vibraphone is one of my favorite instruments. Um, and I don't really get to use it that often, and I, I thought it was great the way that you sort of use it all over the place here. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, and just sort of the same approach is done twice in a row, and that is something I actually kind of have a little bit of an issue with. You had the vibraphone come in and, um, and play, but ju ju just basically speaking, like, some of the accompaniment strategies were just really pretty much the same in both iterations of this opening melody. Um, yeah, with some changes, you know, you, you change the octave here and there, but it was kind of the same approach both times, all the way down to the little timpani roll and everything else. So I'm just wondering whether or not you could have done, you know, you, you are obviously an extremely bright, imaginative orchestrator, and I'm just wondering whether or not you could have done something just completely different on the second time around, all right? But dynamics were cool, a bit strong, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm going to change the, um, let's see, is there a way I can change this view to, um, to a single page? Yeah, I think it's just easier. Right. Okay. 
Yeah, so with, um, yeah, so I, I just think that there is more here. The dynamics are cool, except they're kind of the, you know, it's just like, it's a little less strong, a little more strong the second time, right? Okay, I mean, that's all good. And then here, we've got just more vibraphone, right? Now here, it's more of a solo, because here it's just, like before, it's very heavily, um, it's very heavily covered by doubling. So it's just kind of a, a color to the melody that's being played, except for here it stands out a little bit more. But, but you know, it's just a lot of vibraphone in a row. I like this. I mean, all the ideas are really good. I'm just wondering if the proportions are quite what you need them to be. Flutes, vibraphone solo, uh, artificial harmonics, and pizzicato. That's a really wonderful blend. Um, yeah, so just like... Once again, there's a lot of lot of things in a row of the same color. Like for instance, last score there was just a lot of flute taking the melody all the time, right? So, um, yeah. And then you've got viola solo, which is very cool. Now look, wow, check it out, slurs, and all that other kind of stuff. So where were those previously, right? Right. So you gotta just really have to think things out a little bit more. Now, this is something else I noticed. You just have a basically just a huge old long slur over some of these parts. And you know, look, I've I've said this before and I'm just gonna really keep saying it till people pay attention. Like you have to work out breathing schemes that flow with the meaning of the melody. So because what you've got right here is, you know, um ta 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 or it's ta ta Da, 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 da. Right? When you could just easily have like ta 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 or ta ta da ta da ta 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 da ta da da. You know, there's just a bunch of way of just putting inflections into the melody that that you know that give it more pulse, more meaning, more push, right? As opposed to just making nice long lines, which they flow beautifully, but they don't really have any oomph to them, you know what I mean? Like the melody can be just as rhythmic and just as as massive a statement as any big harmonic chord by the brass or harmonic rhythm by the brass going bum 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 bum. The melody can just have that same power if you will just phrase things and slur things in certain ways, all right? So I want you to think about that. And this is just really not a brass-like, you know, scoring long, beautiful... Um, emotional slurs for trumpets and and horns is is really kind of not in the character. You know, slurs for for the brass are are better when they are smaller, when they are shorter. Right? This is kind of a very sweeping a very sweeping kind of a sound for an instrument that is more um, you know is partially percussive in its attack. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, and and of course, if you have tremolo, you wouldn't be putting slurs over it, right? Okay, there is... I felt that this was actually very sparsely orchestrated, right? Um, you are setting up the climax of the piece. There's barely anything going on in the winds, nothing going on in the strings until right here. Um, so where to go? What happened to our big appassionata, Right? So look, I'm not beating up on you. I'm just you are a really talented orchestrator and I'm just wondering why you're not putting more into things like this. Like there's just is a massive, I mean, look, you should be champing at the bit for the challenge to fill this in towards a mighty climax here, especially if you are influenced by Hollywood scoring, right? You know, you have the flutes doing the counter melody, okay? And there is a little bit of biting counter melody here. Trombones and horns are doubling each other. And and there's nothing in between, right? Well, there's a little bit of viola. But look, I mean, there's so many instruments you could have put on the counter melody here. There are so many instruments you could have used to double the melody, the main melody, right? And um, look, there's no bassoon or contra bassoon on the bass down here. It just really feels sparse when it should be enormous and towering, right? So yeah, so just you know, learn a little bit more about slurring, slurring brass. Study some brass parts, right? See, this is all cool. 
right? That's fine because it's a background kind of thing. But when stating a melody like this, it's really better to use the um, the brass to just really push your point, right? And to and to maybe avoid kind of slurring like this, okay? And and of course you can't slur on a tremolo. So yeah, so that 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 part just confused me, okay? So I'm not I'm not beating up any. I'm just I'm just kind of confused about that. Um, yeah, maybe you're at sort of running out of time here, or you know maybe that's why some of the harmonic elements are missing in some of this wind down. I thought it was kind of cool the way you started just dovetailing across the orchestra. That's all good. I mean, there's a lot that I could pick out, but you know, another thing about this is that with so much scoring, so much you know, so much huge stuff in it, it really just becomes more like a regular, you know, less of just a you know, kind of a featured evaluation that I'm taking a few minutes with and more like a full-time orchestration lesson, which is more what I'm doing on Patreon. Now, this is kind of nice. You'd sort of wind it back to more simple, uh, more simple accompaniment. Yeah, and here was where you were missing the, um, you're missing the middle voice that harmonizes with the, um, you know, with the melody. So yeah, so so anyways, um, without getting into it too much farther, I like the uh, vibraphone solo at the end. That's really cool. The rising, um, the the rising artificial harmonics, but there's like nothing. There's no low pitches here, right? Which there are in the arrangement. I really do think you need some something to ground at the very very end. It does not have to be this line diving towards the bottom. It could just be simple, like double bass pizzicato, or something like that. Anyway, so just the ending feels a little, a little sparse. So look, so look, Astor, it just is a really. I mean, you have a taste for big swooping orchestration, and um, it just kind of almost goes over what I'm able to offer. Uh, and and yet, um, you know, my attempts to help you with it also kind of goes over what I'm able to offer here. Um, just because there's so much to it, there's so much to unpack. There's like, you know, for every page that I just passed, there were like about a dozen more things I could have gone over with, with you. And it really would be better for, you know, this to be a kind of a, like a, a private lesson, but I really don't do those that much anymore. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to be my student. I am totally not out here trying to recruit students at all. Um, I'm just so busy. I mean, I have students, I have people who want to study with me who have wanted to start, and I've just been awfully, you know, they, we're both busy. Usually people who come to me who want to study are already professionals who are doing, um, who need some coaching for what they're doing, and we just end up like barely having any time to meet up. And there are one or two students who've been wanting to book something with me and have been a bit casual about it, and I really should follow up with them. So anyways, but look, I'm I'm not trying to do that, but I'm just saying that some of this really is orchestration teacher territory. But thanks so much for it. I mean, it's really a great, it's like, like almost like a bit of a crescendo to the end of our evaluation, something this monumental. So anyway, just think about a lot of those things that I suggested. And, um, you know, just with everybody else, I would, would love to see your efforts on the next orchestration challenge. Now on to the very last score of, um, this must be like, we're getting into like 60 scores or something like that, or 65 scores. I'd have to count them up, but you know, we're well over, I think we're well over 60 scores at this point for the Facebook evaluations. Thanks much. All right. So our very last score for this uh, challenge for Facebook is by Jessamy. And, you know, once again, I really enjoyed it, listening to it and, and, uh, looking through it and I just want to make one statement I, I I do listen to people's mock-ups and it makes absolutely zero difference to me in terms of my evaluations but I'd kind of like to hear where people are coming from and how the mock-up itself may have influenced the arrangement right just to kind of make sure um, and I'm wondering if you are using the um, the so-called 38 gigabyte uh, sounds that come with uh, with um, with Sibelius because it it um, it's sort of the the sound set for this seemed a little um, um, not primitive but just a little off you know so a lot of the sounds just didn't feel 
really very much like orchestral sounds. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if you've tried out Note Performer, which is very inexpensive and um, has much more realistic sounds and is good for just, you know, just for reference in a mock-up. Um, now, mock-ups really make no difference to me because I just look at the page and I see what it sounds like. Uh, but, you know, but they're very helpful for a developing composer, especially if you are trying to, um, trying to get like a, you know, trying to get a demo or some other kind of thing, or, or you know, uh, something like this uh, out to other people who can give you an opinion or, you know, would just like to hear what it sounds like. So anyway, uh, check out Note Performer. Um, because, like, the thing that really kind of gave it away for me was listening to the sound of the horn, which was, came off as a, as like a, sort of as a muted sound, and just sounded very, um, just kind of very grindy. Do you know what I mean? Kind of very, um, sounded like, sounded muted or stopped, and it just, just really had a kind of a, you know, even for that kind of a sound, it was just a bit strange. Just, just seemed a bit strange to me. Okay, so past all of that, which kind of doesn't make any sense, um, I I think you dropped the first note, the um, the first D flat of the which I mean if that was intentional then <laughs> that's kind of cool, um, but you might have forgotten to put it in. Okay, um, and here I, I feel like you're thinking about what the tonguing and the slurring would be for your uh, wind instruments, and that's good. But think about having them in maybe smaller groups that that have more emphasis across, you know, that, that the where the tonguing can actually add some meaning, right? So right now you've got ta 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 ta. I mean that's really pretty, but I'm just wondering. See, like I like I like this in here. I'm wondering if this could have actually made its way across all of it. Right, so that so that it it would just you know like the idea here is slur from the um, from the end of the dotted rhythm. So you could have gone slur here, slur there, and then this just the way it is, and then slur here, and then slur there. Anyways, it's just a just a thought. Um, then you have the clarinet and the oboe rise together, and at this point you can just drop you know it's like you're adding the two together and you're going to get a color there but you won't necessarily get more strength like if you were doing that in order to get more strength then it's just not going to make much that that much of a difference um the oboe will tend to dominate because it's stronger right here and the clarinet is playing in its throat tones which are not really weaker but they're just less um they're less they have less projection and they have uh less richness of tone Okay, and then you have the um, English horn come in, and that is also going to be a very strong register. Um, you know, this is all clarinet throat tones. So it's going to be a very strong register for the English horn. So it's really going to be dominated. Once you get to those instruments, it's going to be dominated by that sound. And the clarinet won't really start to come into its own until about right here. Um, and nice little touches. I thought that those were really cool, that you sort of kept it more about the winds than about the strings. Okay, going on. This is really cool. I love these um, these harmonics here. So you, what you probably intend is you probably intend this pitch right here to be... Um, a harmonic and this pitch to be a harmonic. In other words, this sound will sound harmonically, right? So the way that this is scored though, it is a little ambiguous, right? It's this is almost like what you would give in terms of a natural harmonic scoring. So the best way to do this is to write it out as an artificial harmonic on the like you just basically write the low A note head and then you put a diamond head a fourth, a perfect fourth above that low A flat, I should say. And then you get this A flat up here to sound. Now, if this were in D major, then you could just get this as a natural harmonic coming off of the A string, right? But since it's it's D flat major, this has to be done as artificial harmonics. And the same thing with this D is you could you could actually get a touch four dynamic um, off of the D string and and as a natural harmonic, even though it's it's fingered like an artificial harmonic, and this would be very resonant where it is too. So the, both of these could be natural harmonics in D major. Um, 
Okay, now here you are having, you're capping this pizzicato, this up upswept pizzicato uh, with bassoon. And you do this kind of strange thing, which is like your cello's here, and then suddenly you're, you are violas here, and then you're back to cellos. And I'm wondering if this was a, a mistake. Because when you do this pizzicato here, you're actually crossing the same area as the bassoons, right? So this these notes are actually going D, A, the same D, A as the bassoons. Whereas if it were cellos, then it would remain below and just sort of complete itself, right? D, A, D, sorry. A, A D, A, D, A. Right? Just leaving out all the flats because that's hard to put in. Um, so when you do this, it is just basically going over the same notes that are about to play in the bassoon. So there isn't the sense of upward anticipation when you have the when you have this an octave higher. Okay. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is slurring from D flat to A flat for the bassoons, it's possible. At pianissimo, it's going to be a little weaker, and 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 you know a lot of people are scoring really high stuff for the bassoon, and and I mean it's it's all possible, but I don't I don't think it's ideal. Like if you really want to get away with this, mark this, write this as a bass clarinet thing, which is just much more, um, I think is much more in tune with what's going on with the uh, pizzicato. I think I think you know this would be just an very easy to play uh, on bass clarinet. And it would fit in with what's going on with everything else a lot better. So that's my suggestion on that. Um, and, you know, nice little flute solo. And once again, you're thinking about the slurring and the phrasing. And I think that that's really great. Okay, I'm not going to critique it any more than that. Okay. Um, and kind of going back and forth between flutes and oboe to keep the... Um, to keep some variation in the timbre of the uh, of the um, of the uh, melody, and I thought this was all very nicely done. Really, little touches by horn. There were one or two things. Yeah, so just the horn in general seems a bit strong, but just so long as you keep it down at pianissimo underneath everything, it should be all right. Um, there's so there are also ways to soften the edge of the horn by doubling it. Um, with say like viola or some other instrument or cello to kind of just like keep it from really pushing out into the texture too much. Okay, and this is fun. Solo, uh, no, unison soli. You don't even need to say that, right? I mean, the the viol the first violin's job is to play soli most of the time. So you don't really have to say soli unless there is some reason to just really push their part out in front of everybody. They know that they are soli. All you have to do is just say unison, right? And since you've actually marked out the divisi here, you might don't even you barely even have to say I mean you should mark divisi, but I mean you barely even have to say divisi unison whatever. I mean, you should, but it's it's like it's sort of taken for granted that that's sort of what's going on there. Um yeah, but this is all nice. Um yeah, I think that you could have had more fluctuations, more nuances in your in your mo melodic lines from time to time, but they're still pretty good, the, the way that you added them in previous parts. But here, you know, like, you know, dun da da dun da 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 you know, like, so by the time you get here, there's a little bit of, of force, a little bit more force going on. Yeah, so there's just, just ways of, of doing this. Or dun da da dun da 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 Yeah, there's just different ways of, of dealing with that line. Okay, and then oboe's taking over. That's neat. And, yeah, doubling with violas. Here, you should mark the viola as uh, treble clef, right? It's just easier for them to read. Because it's getting above... You know, once you get above four ledger lines, it's just... You know, you've got a melody and stuff. It, it might just be easier. You know, it's not necessary, really, but I don't know. You know, it still isn't. It still isn't high enough for some for for some violists to want a treble clef. But then other violists, especially violists who do a lot of contemporary music, like they have no fear of treble clef. That's just like it's especially if they've also, you know, if they kind of graduated to viola from the violin, <laughs> then they really have 
um, kind of no problem because they've already know the fingerings, the way the fingerings look on treble clef, um, sort of for that middle area. Okay, um, yeah, and then doubling English horn with cellos, that's all fun. Um, and we're just sort of building up a head of steam here, and I think that that is, it's very well, uh, it's very well set up, okay? Um, yeah, and uh, always put a, um, always put a slur between two notes of a fingered tremolo, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, same thing here with the winds. Okay. This suddenly becomes barren, like right in here. You can actually hear it in the mock-up too, is that just like, it feels like suddenly there's nothing there, right? Except for just a little bit of strings. So, okay. So now we get to our, uh, appassionata and I'm wondering why there is no, why is there, there's no A flat in the flutes and oboes? Where did they go? So you sort of wanted more of a push. If you really want more of a push on the second beat, then mark it as an accent, right? Which I think it is in, is, is it in the uh, piano part? Dun, 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 and once again, it's missing on this, on the first beat. I, I feel that that is, that is possibly not going to really matter one way or another. So it might as well be in. Um, yeah. So uh, the only thing I would say about this critique is that there's not enough counter melody um, you know, there's like no counter melody between the upper octave of melody, which is, it is in the, um, in the piano part, right? So you basically have dropped it down quite a bit. And, you know, since you've got, you know, you've got double winds here, you know, you could easily just stick in a, like, second flute on the counter melody up here, and it would, really wouldn't lessen the impact of flutes and oboes doubling the um, the violins because like when you double flutes you know you don't necessarily get a stronger sound you get a more stable sound right but and but then again you also get phasing right so there's always that trade-off um yeah but i mean generally speaking pretty good nice little cool down uh a bit barren at places uh, but still okay, and I like I love the use of the bass of the uh, bass clarinet. Um, yeah, and then horns and bassoons is going to be a very very dark color. Um, and then when you have the opposite is light, and once again this is really more of a you know these like A flat octaves going back and forth and stuff in the bassoons. This is really more of a clarinet thing or a bass clarinet thing. Uh, or even like English horn thing, then, you know, people are just throwing in all of these high things for the bassoon, and that's great, but it's more of a soloistic thing or a thing that is sort of, you know, that is achieved by steps rather than leaps. Um, at least in, like, if we're talking semi-pro, um, some regional orchestras, you know, it's it's just a... It's just another thing for the bassoonist to worry about. Probably a lot of bassoonists out there will say, well, it wouldn't bother me, but... I've, I've heard some bassoonists struggle with some of these things. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, since you have the clarinet involved anyway, right? Anyway, or the B-flat clarinet, or ba the bass clarinet, excuse me. Um, yeah. Um, yep. Yep. So... Yep, and, and I like all of this just jumping around without dovetailing. That's kind of fun because, like, when you notice what Jessamy has done here is she doesn't want to dovetail. She wants the voices to be completely contrasting, right? So, so English horn will be definitely a contrast with bass clarinet, and which will be contrasted with bassoon, which will contrast with violas. So everything is actually picked to not sound like the next instrument that plays, except viola going to cellos. That might actually um, not be that different. But then uh, bass clarinet doing this thing. I think you have the wrong note there right at the end. Right? Um, so anyhow, um, so it, it was very, very cool. I really enjoyed this. And it's a fitting end to what was just really a wild ride through everybody's ideas and suggestions and thoughts and so on and so forth. And um, now I'm going to go evaluate some Patreon scores. If people feel happy about their evaluations uh, and want to share them with 
YouTube, then we will do that. Um, I will share some of those, and I will definitely share my take on the um, on how I orchestrated this. And I will make that more of an orchestration lesson than a, an evaluation, obviously, because you know the reasons why I scored everything I think are instructive um, the way that the way that I did. So, anyhow. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all the composers. Um, you know, all at this point, it's like uh, 81 composers got involved with this. 82, if you can't me. And uh, it just, you know, I, I don't think I had one dud of a score. You know, one score where you know, people obviously didn't care what they were doing and they had no talent. That was not true of any single score that I have looked at. And uh, I just really am happy with the way this went. And I'm happy that I was able to do it. And I've actually released, you know, so many, so many videos at this point. I was actually uh, finishing up some other uh, video project at the same time. So I've really, you know, I've released hours and hours, 30 videos, a lot of them, you know, over an hour long over the past month. So thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to Facebook. Thanks to Patreon. And, um... You know, my crowd over on Twitter and everybody out there on YouTube. Thank you very much. This was a pleasure and an honor. And um, I will see you again with more lessons and more fun stuff coming up soon. <laughs>